¿Qué pasaría si en lugar de rechazar, le abriéramos la puerta a la incomodidad? Espacio incómodo es una invitación a humanizarnos. Al autocuestionamiento. A la curiosidad. A la vulnerabilidad. Y a la toma de responsabilidad. Hablemos sin juicio. ¿Es posible usar la incomodidad como un medio para la expansión y el crecimiento? Descubrámoslo juntos. Vámonos, Vámonos poniendo cómodos con, con lo incómodo. incómodo. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a un nuevo episodio de Espacio Incómodo. Hoy estoy muy emocionada de tener aquí a Natalia en el estudio. Eh, este es un episodio un poco distinto porque este episodio lo haremos en inglés. Va a tener subtítulos, así que no dejes de verlo. Eh, pero será pues, un episodio muy, muy, muy profundo. Uh, voy a empezar a hablar en inglés ya, ¿ok, amigos? <laughs> I'm very happy to have Natalia here. Uh, Natalia is a good friend but, uh, and also an amazing human being. She has one of the fastest growing careers at Google as a sales leader and she was the creator of uh, Live Design, a course in Google that grew to thousands of, of, of um, attendees and became a, a, a company of its own. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. But I think what's it's most interesting about Natalia is that this is the less impressive or interesting part about you. <laughs> uh, we have been friends for years and I have learned so much about Natalia. And one of the main things she has taught me about is sexuality. Uh, sexuality, pleasure, and this magnificent idea of how we can design our own relationships. So I think uh, Natalia will be doing a better job introducing herself. So I'm passing the word to you, Natalia. Thank you, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and share this espacio en cómodo <laughs> contigo. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for a nice introduction as well. Uh, you are right, sexuality is something that takes a big part in my heart and in my life as well. And as everybody who studied or works with sexuality, I also came to it uh, looking for some answers for myself. Okay. I was uh, growing up in post-Soviet Ukraine and very early in my childhood I realized that The way I relate to people, the way I get attracted to people was a little bit different than what I saw. Okay. You know, I was living in a heteronormative society way more than it is right now. Yeah. And I'm sure you can relate yes, also yes, yes. <laughs> with your way of growing up. So I had a lot of questions and they were very uncomfortable. I was thinking, what's wrong with me? What's going on? Uh, why me? Like, what is it that I'm experiencing? And for a while, I couldn't really talk to anyone uh, and figure out what is it that I feel to other people that was different. And there was not that many um, TV shows or films or even examples in real life of other ways of love and relationship. Okay. And I uh, remember a very special day uh, when I was a teenager and I actually learned a little bit uh, what, what other things exist and I learned about gay people, but I couldn't really relate to that. Okay. Um, and then once in a village library, I found the book that I felt like changed my life then totally. Yeah. Uh, and now I know it was the beginning of my journey. So it was a book of um, Alfred Kinsey. Okay. And Alfred Kinsey is an uh, American sexologist who, one of the first st studied sex the way we know it. Okay. And he also founded uh, an institute, Sex Research Institute, okay. that exists right now, a very special place. But I got to know him back then as author of um, uh, Sexuality Scale. It's often referred to as uh, Kinsey Scale. Okay. So Kinsey Scale is the first research of other than heterosexual sexuality. And it's a scale from zero to six, starting from uh, heterosexual to homosexual expression of sexuality with three in between, which is bisexual. Okay. But there is also two and four. Two and four are different states when you're not exactly homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual, but you are somewhere in between. Okay. Now we know there are different expressions of that, like queer, questioning, but I had no idea about all of this back then, and seeing that other state made me feel that I'm not alone in these questions, yes. and that sexuality is actually a spectrum. So you don't need to have all the answers straight wow. away. You can really figure out as you go. And it was uh, very special for me because I finally felt like 
I belong somewhere. It was in the book, <laughs> you know, it must be true. So I felt like, wow, I want to learn more. I want to figure out what else is there. And uh, I feel like that was uh, really a beginning of my journey into figuring out more about myself and learning about sexuality. And, uh, you know, um, I also thought back then that maybe uh, more people have questions like me. Okay, yeah. More people feel that maybe they're different and they feel uncomfortable. Because when you're growing up, I think the, the biggest desire we, ha we have is to fit in. Yeah. To be normal. That's what I was going to tell you. I love that Emily Nawowski, what she always says is, you are normal. You're normal. <laughs> right? Like, however, and I think it's an important message to give is, however you live your sexuality, you are normal. You are beautiful. You are deserving of love and affection. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. You know? yeah, and I think that is what's such a powerful thing to feel you're normal. Yeah. Though I really don't like the word norm, but it's very empowering, especially when you feel lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so fast forward to this moment of time, uh, many, many years after, I, uh, I can say that uh, I am a sexual educator. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I uh, did uh, go to academia because I wanted to learn a science part of it, yeah. so I did a postgrad in sexuality and sexual well-being. Uh, but because of my everyday job, which is in tech, yeah. I was also very curious about how technology can enhance our sexual wow. lives. Okay. So a couple of years ago, I got to know about this emerging industry, sex tech. So I also went to school for sex tech founders and uh, tried to combine these two worlds, you know, okay. my work and my passion. And uh, yeah, what I can say right now that I'm very, very, very uh, still curious about it. And I feel like sexuality is like a lifelong journey okay yeah. and this is um, so beautiful because it means that i will never get bored okay we will never get <laughs> bored <laughs> because there are layers yeah. and layers and layers to uncover about each of us yes. and i feel like you know we just really need to um, let ourselves explore and ask those questions and uh, yeah, I think that's what we will do today, no? <laughs> okay, yes, we will explore a lot. So I think my first question, which you mentioned one day when we were eating, and I was like, wow, you said this is a moment in society where there's more information about sex. Mm -hmm. We have porn, we have dating apps, you can have like sex anytime you want. Uh, there's a lot of information. And we are having the least sex we have had in the world history. Yeah. And I think this is a huge paradox, right? And I think my question for you will be like, why uh, don't we have more sex? And is this good or bad? Like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's going on? That's a good one. You are so right. Um, I think I, I, I recently saw, actually like a couple of days ago, I saw this research from Spain. And in this research, they were looking at young uh, adults okay. and um, um, researching how they are consuming porn and when do they start. And it was said that in Spain, boys normally start to watch porn when they are 14 and girls when they are 16. Okay. And there was no research on you know, non-binary people or anything like that. Uh, honestly, I feel it happens way earlier than this yeah. because we have phones, we have internet, we have instant access uh, to, to really anything. Um, as you said, we have these apps. Yeah. And even if you look around all the ads, you know, sex sells, we see constant uh, yeah. pictures, uh, like sexually appealing pictures. We have Instagram with influencers of all sorts. So yeah, there is a lot of sexual content and context around us. Yeah, but um, there is uh, this uh, anthropologist, Helen Fisher. Have you heard of her? I heard, yeah. I've, yeah, I've seen her talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's so cool because yeah. she's researching um, biology and chemistry of love. Yeah, what a yeah. cool job, huh? <laughs> I think she has this book, uh, Anatomy of Love, a uh, pretty good one. So she was in a project uh, for many years in the U.S. U.S. has the most research on this, uh, yeah. as, as usual, right? Uh, so we, we get data from there. She was in a research that was called Singles in America. Okay. And she would talk to more than 5,000 people every year and ask them questions about sex. Okay. What she figured out is that in the last 30 years... Um, the way we have sex and the frequency we have sex really decreased, like dram dramatically, okay. and especially among young people. Okay. So she says that uh, millennials and further generations, Generation yeah. Z, have 
three times less sex than their parents, than wow. our parents. We are millennials, right? Yeah. So why is it happening? Is it good or bad? Well, <laughs> what do you think? I think it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> why? Because <laughs> uh, sex is a really important part of a human being. It's a, I feel, I don't know, I'm going to talk in first person as a woman. I feel like sex is a way of connecting to other humans. It empowers you. It's a stress decreaser. Mm. It provides a connection. Like I think sex done in a healthy way, empowering way. I feel as a woman, it gives, it has, it's, I think for me, it has been a place of healing mm. and feeling more empowered in myself and, and more secure. Like, I feel like, yeah, it has opened and I'm talking in first person, but I feel like way more creative, for example, we're more creative, more innovative. I'm more assertive when I'm mm. a, in a good space sexually. When I'm not, I'm feeling more insecure also in real life. I'm less creative. I hide myself more. So I do see a link between that and my sexuality, personally. And I see it very strongly. It's not like, oh, bit. No, I see it very, mm. very strongly, yeah. It's beautiful what you're saying. So it's like a place of empowerment, <laughs> empowerment for you. Empowerment, yeah. For me, yeah. I feel like I can tell my story with sexuality, but I have had a, ro a hard road towards sexuality. Mm. Um, I was come from a conservative family, very uptight towards sexuality. Sexuality was wrong. It was a sin. You shouldn't do it until you're married. I've never been married, so I shouldn't be <laughs> doing sex. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had a story of abuse, like many women in the world, particularly yeah, Mexicans. Okay. Yeah. And I feel for me, reconnecting to my sexuality was a place of empowerment, of expansion, of love. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things, besides the pleasure, which is really nice, mm -hmm. is one of the most beautiful things we can access as human beings. So I think for me, there is a concern Mm. Uh, when we don't think about sex, but I would lo love to hear your perspective. Yeah. So for you, it was a journey. For me, it was definitely a journey. It was a journey of deconstruction. Yeah. Because I feel word, yeah. a bit of what you're saying is that what I realized is that everything I knew about sex was not not accurate. It was very far from reality of what sex is. Mm. There was a lot of shame, a lot of pressure, a lot of scripts, ideas, you know that it was a long process to reconnect back to my body, to remove those scripts. I don't think now I'm like, eh, is that a sex expert? Not at all. But I feel I do have a connection, beautiful connection with my body and my sexuality. And I feel that that has transformed my life. For example, I don't think I would be doing a spasso incomodo mm. if, it, if I hadn't healed my sexuality. I wouldn't have the, the... I do this, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I don't know if I should share, but I don't care what people think about me. You know, I'm doing this because I love it, because I think this idea should be shared. And I think there's a correlation with me reconnecting to my sexuality, with my inner lioness, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this ability to, to express myself and to don't care about what people need to say about me. So I don't know if there's research around this, because I feel there is. I feel my friends that are very empowered in their sexuality, they have this inner, inner strength, I would call it. But yeah. I would love to see your perspective. We often say that, uh, or we, we can feel this when okay. we arrive to a better place, actually, okay. that this is our vital energy, ah, right? Okay. And uh, I like to more relate to scientific part of things, but I think we can't ignore it. It is, especially for, for women, this is something that really helps us express ourselves, yes. get creative. Yeah. Uh, we give life, we create in this world, right? Okay. So connecting to our sexuality actually unlocks something that helps us to be more uh, powerful, more creative, give. Uh, give, give, give. I think that's what I think. <laughs> So it's scientifically proven, like when a woman reconnects to her sexuality, she's more... Willing, like able to create, to give, to yeah, 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 yeah. And I think this is exactly what you described. Yes, yes, yes. This is it? what I in a different word, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Wow, this is fascinating. Okay, and what I think one of the biggest questions is when we think about a society that is not having sex. We the word that comes in is sex drive. Like I think for for mm. me for a long time I was either I was very afraid of sex because I think in my mind because of trauma sex was related to danger and yeah. to abuse. But also I would find myself, I didn't have like desire, you know, like I wouldn't mm. walk into a place and see a man and be like, ah, oh, you know, what would you say about like, what is sex drive? Is it something? Is it not something? Like what, what, what happens with desire? Yeah, I think that we talk about this pop culture yeah. uh, that creates uh, 
pressure for us uh, to have sex, have a lot of sex, have sex frequently, yeah. many lovers. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, we started to feel it as women too. It was not something that was allowed for us in yeah. many cultures for yeah. many years, but I think now we do have it. But I think science is also a little bit guilty of creating that pressure for us. Okay. So when you say sex drive, uh, where this expression is coming from, you probably heard or used the word libido. Yeah. Yeah, so libido is uh, from Latin uh, and it means lust and desire. Okay. And libido uh, is the word that Freud used in psychoanalysis. Okay. So it's a more or less medical term that then transferred to our lives as well. So we started to talk about sex, libido as a drive. Yeah. Okay. And what is a drive really? Drive is something that is essential for your life. So it's life or death kind of thing. Uh, it's uh, hunger. Yeah. Hunger is a drive. Thirst is a drive. Um, ability to breathe is a drive. Because if you don't do it, you will die. So right? like connection is a drive? Connection is not a drive. Okay. We as humans, we seek for connection, but okay. also we can exist in Without isolation connection. for some time. I think for sex specifically, when we think about sex is not a drive, what it means for us that we will not die if we don't have okay. sex. You know, <laughs> we'll be fine. We will not die. As, as a society, we will die because we need to reproduce, <laughs> right? But as individuals, we will not die if we don't have sex. Okay. And knowing this, at least for me, it removes that pressure of having sex no matter what, or having a lot of sex, or looking for any sort of sex. It brings me to a place when I can consider having sex worth having. Okay. So when we reprogram the way we think about wow. sexual desire and drive and look more into pleasure, we can really make choices that make us more fulfilled and we can have sex worth having. I, can I tell you something that I think is beautiful from what you say? I think for me, when I started to talk about the abuse, going to therapy, working on it, a part of me felt I was broken, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is hard to hear, but I don't think it's very uncommon. I think a lot of people feel broken in their sexuality. And I think for me, the solution was to force myself to be in situations where I didn't want to be. And in retrospective, I realized that that was even more hurtful. Great, and even when, more trauma. Even more trauma. And when I decided to stop, and to connect with myself, with my body, and to do something that felt good for me, and like quiet voices around me, it was when I started to heal, and my perspective of sex changed, and now I love sex. No. But I think uh, something beautiful you say is like sex worth having, and I think mm -hmm. that was my insight, right? Like I'm not going to do anything where I don't feel my body is ready, and it's comfortable, and that it's aligned with me, and it doesn't matter what any other people say, any scripts, any expectations from society, I'm going to do what feels good for me. And I think that is what you mean, right? With sex worth having is the only sex we should be having. Exactly. And if it's non-sex, exactly. it's perfect. Yeah. And if it's sex with yourself, it's perfect. Yes. And if it's with 10 people, it's perfect. You know? <laughs> but it's about what feels good for you, not what society is asking. You know? And about conscious choice. So I think one of the things that hurts sexuality the most is these scripts, right? Like you were mentioning porn, how young people are having access to porn really early, all the pop culture, propaganda see around, and I feel there's this idea of what sex should be like mm. and what we should be as sexual beings, and I feel it's an absurd standard. Almost it, like step-by-step step step guide. Step-by-step yeah. by <laughs> step guide, either you know it or you don't know it, yeah, yeah. either you're good or you're bad, and if you're bad, you should be ashamed and you're not a good person and, you know, like there's something wrong with you. And I feel like one of the things that when we were asking at the beginning uh, why what, the, about the sex paradox that we are having the sex for my intuition, tell me that it has to do a lot with these sex scripts. Mm. What would you say about sex scripts? Yes, I think you are so right, especially about porn. Um, I don't know how, where your journey, how you educated yourself yeah. on sex, uh, on sex, how we normally yeah. perceive it. Again, it's a big question, what is sex, yeah. right? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. What is yeah. sex? Yeah. Should, after this, we should go into what is sex. <laughs> what yeah, is sex? I, I love it, I love this question, yeah. But if you think about porn, and I had access to porn also quite early, it's, first of all, not real sex. Yeah. 
Porn is entertainment. Yeah. Porn is uh, a movie. Yeah. There are people, there are actors hired for that. But very often it becomes the first source of sex education for everybody. What we see in mainstream stream porn is, um, first of all, it's shot with the male gaze, right? To please a male audience. And it often has um, really exploitative attitude to women, women yeah. that are pictured there. And this is what we learn. I remember this episode of uh, Black Mirror. Have you seen that no. TV show? There was an episode about future where mother was uh, monitoring her daughter and she saw how her daughter has sex with her new boyfriend, a teenage daughter. And daughter was expressing herself exactly like in porn with a lot of uh, noise and specific uh, breath type, you mm. know, this... And uh, the boy was saying, I don't need this. You yeah. don't have to be like that. Yeah. And she didn't know the other way how to be. Because that was the way she learned you have to be as a yeah. woman. That's what she saw in porn. And did she like it? I doubt it really, right? We know when we connect to ourselves, we can be anything we want in that yeah. process. But to copy the script, uh, it puts the script in your head. So wow. you go through the script and... Uh, you cannot connect to what you really want. Yes. Yeah. What are the scripts that you went through in your life? <laughs> I, think, I don't know if we can get personal yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> we can get personal. It's okay. It's espacio incómodo. If I'm doing espacio incómodo, then I need to be put myself there. I think for me, there was like a big battle, right, within me. Apart mm. from like the very conservative culture that sex was wrong. I think that yeah. part was like a big shift. Even now I'm doing this talk and I'm feeling like, oh, if my brothers, my family sees me talking about this, it's shameful, you know? Like yeah. a big part of my education was about sex being forbidden, forbidden and uh, wrong, and right? And dangerous. And dangerous, dangerous. exactly. Yeah. And then the other big part was that I was not good enough. Yeah. So I didn't, like I was not beautiful enough. My body was not pretty enough. I didn't know how to move. I remember when I was in high school, um, like people would laugh at me because I was not sexy, right? Like mm. it was, I was a bit, uh, you're not sexy, you're not a sexy woman. And I think growing up, I had this like deep entrenched feeling of like, I am not sexy. Mm. You know, I, I do not match the standard. And I remember like when I would try to cross this border, I would read like Cosmopolitan, you know? And it's like, now I think it's shit. Like Cosmopolitan is shit. It's like totally disconnected, absurd. And I think for, for me, the other reason that I think we could talk about it is I, I had a pat pattern for choosing a abusive partners, mm. you know, so partners that were not very respectful of me. And I didn't have any desire to connect with them because they were not respecting me. And then I thought there was something wrong with me because I didn't want to express myself physically with them. And growing up, I realized that was also a script. You don't want to connect physically. Your body won't want to connect physically mm. with someone that is not being caring and nurturing. At least for me, I realized that for me to open up, I need to feel cared for and seen and loved and respected. And no, this is when happens, my body opens. What happens often I see though, and this is sad, but uh, I went through this myself and I think if we open this up to the audience yeah. and really let our listeners to think about it, for uh, women often we are educated in a way to uh, serve men. Yeah. So even you were conscious enough to feel that, yeah. that you're not connected to them and you don't want to go for it, which is super healthy and great. Yeah. But how many times it happens when we force ourselves to go for it? Wow. Also because we learn it this way. Yes. Yeah. And honestly, with the rays of awareness around sexuality, uh, there are many things that pop up. And I think the initial wave of all of the courses, um, all of the trainings was about how to please a man, oh, you know, uh, yes. like how to do a best blow job, exactly. how to do yeah, this exactly. and that. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's great to have the skills, but at the same time, don't we need to start with ourselves, you know? Wow, this is it's yeah. big, right? It is, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And like, if, if we could like go into because I feel the scripts is one of the things that blocks sexuality the most. At least thinking about Latin America, so I think one of the biggest scripts is you are here to pleasure a man, right? Like you are an object of pleasure, and you need to move in a certain way, do certain things to be valuable enough for him. Mm. So if you do the correct things, then you are really a sexual being because he is enjoying. What would you say? I think this one is a big one in LATAM. 
Um, I, I don't know about Europe, but uh, what would you say? I can talk about entire Europe, but I think if we look into um, history, um, how we were brought up as society and even to religion, okay. it was very interesting to study sexuality because we went into study sexuality reflected in different religions. Okay. And you would see the attitude to men and women and what were the scripts prescribed for you know, each of the gender, how wow. to behave. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of uh, popular in majority of religions, unfortunately, for women to be a thing uh, in a property of a man, okay. either a father or her husband. So men would transition women exactly. in a property from one to another, and uh, this would define her role. So I think what we see in sexuality, it has very deep roots. It goes through our entire uh, life, through any part of its life. You know, how we build norms of morality and uh, what we believe in. So these scripts are deeply rooted in us, in patriarchy. <laughs> Kill the patriarchy! <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, they, they are reinforced also. So like, I think our goal is to break through them. However, I also want to mentioned that I think not only we as women have scripts. Yes. Okay. Very <laughs> I feel you agree, right? I totally Men agree. also have a lot of scripts and they are not in a better condition very often. <laughs> I totally agree with you. A lot of men come to me and they say it's espacio incomodo only for women. Mm -hmm. And they're very interested in espacio incomodo because yes, I feel no, espacio incomodo is not only for, for women. Everybody. <laughs> because I don't think the patriarchy affects women only. And yeah. I don't think sexuality is viewed in a perspective that decreases its, its, its potential for women, I feel it's exactly the same for men. And I feel men are also blocked to their sexuality. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to tell who is worst off, to be honest. <laughs> like I've, you know? It's hard to compare. Everybody has compare. their exactly. own problem, but right? But I feel there's so much pressure and there's a script yeah. around men. Like, what would you say about the scripts for men? Oh, plenty, huh? Yes. <laughs> horrible! Plenty of scripts, you know? Uh, I, I don't want to get too personal, but I'm sure that we all can remember some cases and uh, something that I just I just went back in my memory to, to this situation. So I was uh, starting to see somebody, okay. a man, and we were um, getting to it, right? Yeah. So I think we were in a couple of dates and then... I was at his place for dinner, and it was very romantic, very beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, lovely, very good atmosphere. I felt relaxed and happy to see where it's going to get, uh, get us. And then, you know, uh, after we had some wine and so on, he tells me, there is one thing you need to know about me. I was like, okay, what is this mm -hmm. thing? Yeah, He says, uh, I'm absolutely terrible at sex. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. Uh, I uh, felt that he was anxious and he was a bit nervous, you know, and I wanted to know what does he mean, <laughs> what yeah. he meant by that, yeah. So I told him, uh, tell me a bit more, what do you mean by this? And when we got to the core of it, uh, and I'm so grateful he was open and he yeah. felt he can talk yeah. about it, he said, uh, well, I have a performance anxiety. And this is what we hear a lot, right? Yeah. Because again, men were also educated in porn. And in porn, what we see, we see hours of hours of intensive action. And uh, also men think that they need to deliver. They need to be there. They need to be always ready. And they need to always want sex. And they need to be very, like, you know, even immediately the, yeah. aroused. And right? this conversation <laughs> around size, like, mm. is really horrible. You know, yes. like, your value as a person is determined by the size of something you cannot control. It doesn't exactly. say anything about your inner world. And, and it's a conversation they hear all the time growing up, like what is the size of your penis? You know, how hard yeah. it gets, how long? And, and there are this um, um, comparison also in different races, right? Yeah. So some stereotypes we yeah. have and like it's automatic uh, that, yeah. that we think this way. Yeah, so... Um, you know, when we, in that situation with that man, when we talked and uh, I told him, um, let's see what it's going to be. I'm sure that we're going to have a great time. Yeah. Let's see where it takes us. Let's just be close wow. to each other. Let's feel each other. Let's see how, how our bodies connect. 
and then we figure out the way they connect. Yeah. So it really felt, uh, make him, made him feel comfortable and uh, it was a beautiful experience. And I think also removing that pressure from men about performance yes. is super powerful. And this is a terrible script that exists in the world also for them. And it's, I think going back a bit to, to the question we, you were saying is what is sex, right? <laughs> yeah. Because I think in our society, sex is... Penis, vagina, in, out, in, out, very hard, very intercourse, hard. Intercourse, right? Intercourse, yeah. orgasm, ah! And what would you say is sexy? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say sexy is? Because you, <laughs> you had your journey. <laughs> I think sex, I, I think I would say like penetration is 5% of sex. I think everything is sex. Like everything every, is every sex, sex, right? Can be. Because everything is life. And I think sex is about living in life. I think sex is about allowing yourself to have pleasure. I feel like, for example, self-pleasure is very sexual and it's beautiful and it's a huge part of sex. I feel touching myself like this could be very sexual. I feel sharing with another human, hugging another human in a loving way also mm -hmm. is very sexual. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel penetration is also, you know, sex. I'm not going to say it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel it's just a part of it. Yeah. And I feel for me, and I'm going to speak in first person, not as an expert, but like relating to my experience, sex as penetration became way more pleasurable when the rest of my life became more pleasurable. Mm. So when I was like showering and touching my body and like looking in the mirror and be like, oh, wow, even if I have a belly, I love my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm beautiful the way I am. I'm so happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would hug someone and be like, wow, I love this person so much. Mm. You know, and like when I hug my friends and I feel like from that place of love, that is also sexual and that opens for sexuality. Mm. And I feel, yeah, that for me would be sex. But I feel like before I started this journey of under, like learning and transforming my perception, I felt sex was, you know, like... Something a, specific. Something specific, yeah. very actual, very related to porn. And now I think that sex is way more than that. And that is a, an interesting part of sex. Mm. But it's not the main point. And I feel like when we, as humans, and maybe you can tell us a bit more, we are focused on seeing sex as penetration. What we do is we have less penetration and less sex and less of that because I found that when I feel cared for, loved, secure, safe, that is for me what opens the channel. Yeah. And that happens in the street, when I'm walking, when someone holds my heart, when they, my heart and my hand, <laughs> when someone <laughs> listens to me, uh, when I feel seen. Mm. And then from that place, then we can transport it to something else. But it's not the other way around for me. And yeah, I think for yeah, most yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, uh, even these words that we're using, intercourse or penetration, there is also outer course or foreplay. We love to label everything, yeah. right? Uh, everything in, is sex. But I think even the way we think about it, the moment we bring to equation people that are not heterosexual Wow. or are not of a, a usual gender expression. Yeah. These things make no sense because yeah. a lot of people cannot or do not want to have any sort of penetration yeah. or maybe they are transitioning so this is not an option. What do they do? They also have sex. Yeah, yeah. So sex is really everything. And I'm actually a little bit sad that we call big part of what's going on with us a foreplay. I think it's a main play. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, um, I, I have read amazing, amazing book. Uh, it's called Magnificent Sex, okay. Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers. Magnificent Sex, Lessons from Extraordinary... Okay, I want to read Extraordinary this. Lovers. Extraordinary <laughs> Lovers. I want to read this for sure. So this book, it's, it's not a sort of entertainment book. It's uh, the biggest um, interview study ever conducted in this field. Okay. Uh, with um, a lot of people that would be representatives of different gender expression, sexual orientation, um, social classes, and so on. And I think it even in includes 20 sex therapists. So okay. in this study, uh, two um, PhDs, they were asking their audience uh, to go back to the memory of the best sexual experience they ever had. Mm -hmm. And through interviews, because it's like qualitative study, they were asking them to describe what made their sex so magnificent. Okay. 
And uh, what did they found? <laughs> obviously, this is very hard yeah, right? yeah, yeah. to even extract this information because people would go back to their memories and bring yeah. a lot of components. So components that were uh, identified as the major for magnificent sex were things like connection, presence in the moment, wow. ability to communicate without fear, okay. authenticity, genuity to be who you are right wow i think that's okay it's yeah. a bit of what i was describing yes. without knowing this wow. yeah. vulnerability was the the big one and i think another one was ability to take interpersonal risks okay. because when you're vulnerable like when we are in a sexual experience whatever it is for us we are the most vulnerable we could yeah. be right and I we feel are like, like naked perhaps <laughs> we are open we are there you know so the ability to take risks and be encouraged for that was a very very big one um and communication yeah wow. and i think like thinking about this story you say about this man and i feel many men feel like him i think he was just brave enough to be yeah. voice it and i feel it's beautiful that what what open or enable the connection was to create this safe space, space where he could share his vulnerability and he knew he was with someone that was not going to reject him because of being vulnerable. Mm. And I feel like that is what makes sex such a beautiful thing mm. when it's done in a magnificent way, right? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a place where we can open ourselves to be authentic and loving and show ourselves how we are. And explore. And explore yeah. Yeah. Figure out what is it that works for us, for two of us, for three of us, whoever is participating in this. Actually, in this study, there were also minor components that were mentioned. And those minor components were sexual act itself, okay. intercourse, um, physical attraction, and orgasm. And actually, orgasm was mentioned the last yeah. like little uh, people mentioned that as a very important thing and i think it's it's really fascinating because things that we are taught to think sex is were not the things that were mentioned as major components yeah. of sex so nobody said intercourse penetration was the main one you know it all came in the very end and this is very important as well like the intensity of sex the physical pleasure i mean it's it's beautiful right it's it's such a big part but at the same time those other components that are more on um mental state i would say they came first i love this thing about magnificent sex and it's a book i'm <laughs> gonna buy as soon as we finish recording this i'm gonna go get it uh, i love these studies um So, like, if, if you think about, for example, my shame story and, and my own, uh, like, going through through sexuality, sexuality, <laughs> um, how could I, like, how can we craft our own magnificent sex? Like, thinking about that you're experiencing design thinking and desi life design <laughs> yeah. and, and this insight about magnificent sex, how could we design magnificent sex for ourselves? Oh, uh, I think it's a question I ask myself every day as well. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think we all should because magnificent sex will change with us and with changes in us. Okay. I think as we go through life, we figure out more about who we are, what we like, what we don't like, and uh, we can communicate better. Hopefully, we learn to communicate better. Yeah. And then we can always craft a new way to have, to have yeah. magnificent sex. However, I think uh, first and foremost, we really need to relearn what we know about ah, sex yes. yeah we do. <laughs> see, 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 see. we do and it brings me to one example from business world okay. <laughs> so at google um we were doing trainings for our new hires for okay. we call them nooglers you know that <laughs> i was in google too <laughs> yes. that's how we met um so we were doing trainings on um uh, how to explain very difficult technical concepts to audience that lacks attention, oh, okay. sorry, lacks expertise in it. Okay. Yeah? So we had this exercise and it's super fun. We took uh, two people, uh, set them in front of each other and said, okay, imagine that you are one of you, is an alien that came to this world and you, the other one, is a human, you're a human, 
that will be explaining an alien how to navigate this world. Okay. Yeah. And we said something simple, explain to an alien how to tie uh, the shoelaces. And what came out of it was like, Magnificent. <laughs> Because to explain an alien that never been in this world yeah. how to tie shoelaces, they had to start way, way, way What is further. a shoelace? Like, why do we use Not shoes? Not even there. It was more like, okay, so how do you move through space? Do you have legs? If you have legs, do you use them when you walk? Do you walk? You know, things like that. And then, okay, do you have feet? And when you walk and touch the surface, does it hurt you? You know? Mm -hmm. And only then they would get uh, to, to shoes and what are the shoes and what they are for to protect your feet. And only then they will go to shoelaces. Okay. <laughs> so I think relearning about sex, we can actually all imagine ourselves as aliens. Wow. And try to explain things that we always knew are certain way wow, in a wow, new way. Wow, 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 I love it. Yes. I think it's called beginner's mind, right? To approach things with the beginner's mind. When you don't have preconceptions about something, but you really feel like, okay, let's figure out together. But it's real. Like, if you think about it, you and me, right? We have been friends for, for, for years now. And we have had these really deep conversations. Yeah. And we have shared... I love it so much. <laughs> and we have shared very special moments. I think we have got both seen each other grow. Uh, at yeah. least I'm going to talk in first person. You are someone that has really oh, helped same. me grow. <laughs> you know, I think part of big part of who I am now in my journey, in my sexuality is you, you, you're a relevant person in my life and I adore you. you. Thank you. But we are aliens to each other. We you know? are. You know, yes. like you have, even right now we're in the podcast or when we have been walking, we have been in many parts of the world together, but our perception of the world is totally different. You know, my mental state, my the way I read reality, the way I feel, the way I like to be touched. We are aliens to each other. Yeah. I have my, my mind is a totally different universe than your life, right? So if we're thinking about any way of connecting to another human, we really need to start by the base that we are aliens. That you in front of me, even if we know each other for so long, You're totally different from me. Yeah, what is this body? How yeah, does exactly. it work? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very different. Mm. So it's, um, it's a bit silly to, to, assume. to assume that we all want the same things, that we all perceive reality in the same way. We all are totally different. Like every head, and you know, it's this phrase, every hair, head is a universe. Yes, yes. I think it's like that with everything in life. And yeah. if we could uh, approach things with beginner's mind and curiosity, we would be probably way kinder to each other, but also to ourselves. It just reminded me about uh, this person on my team who's colorblind. And it was, uh, it's not a big thing or anything. It happens very often, yeah. right? But uh, once I caught myself uh, when they were telling me how they drive a car, And they see the traffic lights. Mm. So they know that green is uh, below and red is right. above. And I never thought of this because I see colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even place straight away yeah. where the color is. Yeah. But this is how they perceive the world. And for them, that was absolutely normal. That was their way to navigate. And for yeah. me, it was a different way to navigate. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But all the ways were, were true and they worked. <laughs> And I think I'm, I'm coming to, to a very beautiful conclusion. I don't know what you would think about it, but that sex in the end is really about kindness. Oh, yes. You yes. know, like magnificent sex is not about being the best. Yeah. It's not about the script. It's not about fitting a standard or being this way or looking this way or moving this way. That is something that has been imposed to us. Mm. And in reality, what sex is, is... What magnificent sex is when I'm able to see you. See you. Truly see truly you. Truly see you. And, and when, hear you. And hear you. And we can create a space for you to be you in your own alien way. Yes. is a place where we can really create for you to be you. Mm -hmm. And then you can create a space for me to be me. And in that place we can communicate of if we want to be touched or held mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. But I feel like in reality, magnificent sex is, is really about kindness. And vulnerability. So powerful. so powerful. And, you know, I, I'm thinking now that all my life, um, when I thought of sexual experience, I felt it's a game 
Okay, it's a playground. Wow, okay, I'm interested. For, for adults, yeah? Uh, because when we grow up, we become very responsible, we have so many things to care about, and we forget how to play. And there are not that many parts in our lives where we can express that creativity. Espacio right. Encomodo is you expressing yeah, your creativity. Yeah, it's my playground. Dance is expressing yeah. your creativity. Singing is, yes. you know, and sex is too. It's a wow. playground for adults. Yeah. And when we bring a little bit of uh, games, when we bring a little bit of humor, humor is so big. Yes, it's important. <laughs> it's so important. It's so yeah. important to be able to laugh yeah, on yeah. ridiculous moments because sex is sometimes uncomfortable and sometimes it's like silly, it you know. It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, we get to know each other. We don't know. So bring all of this and make it as a playground. Oh, it just removes all these pressures and there are no scripts anymore because when you play, you create your games. Yeah. <laughs> You know? I love this thing about playing and, and I think maybe that is the link with creativity, you know, mm. like because you're allowing yourself to explore a reality you didn't know. And I'm thinking now like we could talk about like beautiful partners and maybe I will share this, right? But I think that there's been beautiful men in, in my sexual history, like in this place of healing. And what I realized is that what these men were able to do with me is create a safe atmosphere. And mm. now that we're talking, they were they were seeing me, they were seeing Isa, you know, with Weird things, awkward things, funny things, <laughs> beautiful things. And in these places of communication, I was able to heal. Mm. Uh, we don't have fair here in, in right now, but with fair we talk about a lot of like these, these spaces where, where when we are able to heal, and I think I've talked about this with you as well, when we go through a beautiful sexual experience, it doesn't have to be intercourse, but when we are seen and yeah, cared yeah. and there's kindness and there's vulnerability, I feel there's a deep healing in all areas of life. Yeah, yeah. You know, these are very transcendental and transformative experiences because when once you are seen from this place of love and care and compassion, and this other person, for me, for example, I, and I'm sharing too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an episode like that. <laughs> but I, like now that I'm listening to you, like going back, and I, I would like to thank all these men. It's not that many, okay? <laughs> but. I feel like this place where, where they were respectful mm. and I felt I could show them this part of me that felt broken. Yeah. And when I show this part of me that I felt was broken and that if I showed was going to be rejected and they responded with love mm. and I think I'm going to cry, I think that was such a powerful moment for me, you know, like of being shown, like I feel this is wrong with me and if you see it, you won't love me. And then for another human being to be in front of me and saying, you know, I love you, I love you. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter, yeah. you know? And I think that is a deeply transformative experience to go through. Actually, one of other components of magnificent sex I forgot to mention was feeling of transcendence. Wow. So when you go through such a deep personal experience okay. and you are understood, you feel transcendent, you feel bigger, than life bigger than yes, this world you true. feel one when we say we we unite wow. with somebody and we feel one but we don't only feel one with that person or people we feel one with universe oh, it's so beautiful i love this feeling so <laughs> doesn't happen every time but when it does wow. you know? it's so beautiful <laughs> yeah I transcendence remember, i remember it's not similar it doesn't have related to like sex story but i used to live with a Turkish man, you know him, right? And he's a beautiful man, very beautiful man. <laughs> yes. And we, we didn't fight a lot, but one day we had this really big fight. And because we didn't fight a lot, it felt like a huge thing. And he was very sensitive for when I felt angry because I'm mm. very, very like expressive about my love and I hug and I say, mm. and he would really feel it when I was like... When it was gone, yeah. When I was withholding a bit. And so he came to the house and he said, Isa, we, we, wanna, we need to talk because I can't stand this thing. And so we sat down and it was such a beautiful thing, Natalia, because we started talking and he just understood me, you know? And he was just really trying to see what was happening to me. And he was not trying to judge me or point at me or being like, you this, you that, that, that. He was just listening to my pain and to my story. Mm. And I remember that, of course, all my anger went away, but I started to cry, you know, at the middle of the fight. And it was not that I was crying out of, like, anger or anything. I cried because I had never felt so seen and so loved, mm -hmm. you know. And in this place of, of deep, yeah, deep, 
I, it was moving my own wound what happened. It didn't have mm. anything to do with him. But the fact that he was able to sit down with my wound and hold the space for me to explore my wound and say, I love you mm. with this wound. I remember I, I cried and cried. Even when I tell you I cry, mm. because I'd never felt till that point so loved and so seen. Mm. And I feel like later on, this is what a beautiful sex partners can do for us. And I think going back to sex worth having, is uh, that is very important. We shouldn't be having sex just to have sex, just to match a standard, just to be... I think sex is such a powerful healing force that it needs to be done in a context where we are really in a place like this, you know? Like when he tell me, he said, what is going on with you, baby? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I, I can listen to you. I can hold you. And I think that is transcendental. Yeah. Want to thank that man? Yes, we lo he knows I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he knows I, I adore him. Uh, but yes. Um, there is one exercise for communication uh, of your sexual worries and desires. Okay. And I know you do nonviolent communication yes. courses. And you know, a big part of it is active listening. Yes. And I believe this is something that... Uh, often is not happening because we listen to talk, we listen to say something. While we are listening, we're preparing that respuesta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm going to say back, how what I'm going to defend say. myself. No? And Pro the exercise is about, um, can, can be run in many ways. For example, you meditate with your partner and then you go and you set a timer and you take three minutes for each of you. Okay to talk yeah. and you talk for that three minutes one person talks and they express themselves from I place okay. how I feel yeah. and the other person cannot do anything they just listen okay yeah and then they switch so it really in a way forces you but also teaches you to be an active listener and what you described God I feel it also it's so yeah. powerful Super it's uh, one of the biggest pleasure in life is to be understood Wow. And I can relate to this, especially with uh, the beginning of my journey, but also further in life, um, because um, I am uh, living uh, in, in a um, different relationship orientation right now. I'm uh, in non-monogamous relationship for many years. And to be able to be heard and understood wow. meant uh, love. For me and still does because it is yeah. one of the biggest biggest pleasures really i think it do you know teach not han no tell me Th well Thich Nhat Hanh, he's he's a buddhist monk he transcended a few a few months ago but he's one of the biggest buddhist teachers zen buddhism um and i love him i have many books of him here <laughs> you can see them uh, but one of the most beautiful videos i saw him is with oprah and in that video he says that the biggest expression of love we can do for a human being, and it's like the biggest, is to be present for their pain. Mm -hmm. So it's when you're there and you say, baby, I, well, not baby, he did you <laughs> baby. <laughs> he says, I see your pain and I'm here. And it's the capability of being present for someone else's pain, not trying to fix it, not trying to do anything, mm -hmm. but being like, I see your pain and I'm here. And touching on the exercise you were doing, I do a lot of trainings. Yes. Hopefully you already know everybody in the past couple, and I used to do mostly trainings when I was back in Google. And one of the exercises we did was based on what you're saying, right? The, the three minutes and the three minutes. But something we would add in very intimate trainings was to loop back on what the person was feeling. So what you're mm -hmm. trying to do is when the person is talking to you, what you're doing is you're trying to listen for what they're saying, but also how they're feeling. And what they're not saying. Exactly. And you don't need to agree with them. But when you look back, you say, I hear you say this and I, feel, I hear you feel this way. Okay, so we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff. And sometimes people ask us for tools, mm. like a specific things we can do to transform, to shed these scripts. So what are some of the tools you, you, you think would be interesting for the audience to hear? There are so many. Yeah. <laughs> Where does that? I see you have something very important yes, yes, over yes. here. Yeah, so, Emily. <laughs> I love Emily now. I know we I talk know, so I, much yeah, about yeah, it I that we, we really should start here. I think Emily Nagoski is really someone who gave us a lot of hope. Yes, yes. <laughs> gave us a voice. Yeah. Gave us a lot of tools to get to know ourselves, yes. right? Yeah. 
I know that you're a big fan. Would you like to talk a bit about it? I can talk about Emily Nagoski. And lot. I can add, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think I found Emily Nagoski a long time ago and then you reintroduced me to her. So I've been reading Emily's work for a long time. I love her her very famous book, Come As You Are, but she's also now in a in a TV show in Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she has a pleasure. podcast. She has a podcast yeah. and she's just unbelievably amazing. So cool. What I love about Emily Nawoski, I think for me, is that she mixes science and she and she mixes science with, with knowledge. So it's very science-based <laughs> and that I don't know. <laughs> I'm very spiritual and say I'm very hippie, but I really like science. Um, and also she's very, the way she explains things, she always talks about how we are all normal, right? I will pass the word to you, but I think for me, the, one of the most transformative things about Emily is this book. Because it's a workbook. So mm -hmm. first, I, I mean, I've read Come As You Are many times. I've heard it in Audible. I marked my, my most important points. I'm an earth, if you had uh, any doubt <laughs> around this. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but the workbook was transcendental. I feel the other things were very interesting, but I feel like when I started to do the exercise, they're very mild, they're very soft, mm -hmm. and they build, on one builds on the other. Um, and so, yeah, there's ones about like looking at yourself in the mirror, questioning yes. what are your arousal points, what are your breaks, yeah. how do you feel, what contexts are good for you. Yeah. And I feel like coming from a place of knowing yourself, mm -hmm. then everything changes. Do you think we should reintroduce this... Uh Dual control model? Yes, yes, yes. Like, I think if, whatever you talk about, Emily Nawoski, I can hear it, love to hear it, love to hear it, because I feel I love, I really like her work. Yes. I wrote yes. in a paper that the person I would like to meet the most this year is the Dalai Lama and Emily Nawoski. So, I so, would love so, to. Maybe we will meet her yeah. next year. So, so year. you understand how, how relevant she is in my life. Yes. You know what? Uh, I will talk about Emily in a second. Uh, I just wanted to drop one name okay. for men. Okay. Because okay. Emily Nagoski really transformed the way women, especially heterosexual women, yeah. uh, see themselves. But there is a, a person called uh, Kenneth Play. Okay. Kenneth uh, Play. I want to take Kenneth Play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he has a book. I have it at home. Uh, bought it for some of my partners. <laughs> it's called Beyond Satisfied. And I think Kenneth Play is uh, doing uh, something similar like Emily did for women, but for men. And he looks into more of a physical part of things, okay. but uh, he also explains to men how to figure out their own sexuality and how to become wow. better partners for their female partners. Can you repeat it? The name of the... Kenneth Play. And the, the book? Beyond Satisfied. Okay, Beyond I think Satisfied. It is. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> In my list. <laughs> yes, yes. I think it's just great when um, author talks uh, to their audience in appropriate language. And of course, we 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 know this uh, project is for, for anybody, really. Yeah. But I think uh, I myself will, will have more experience with women because yeah. I am a woman as yeah. well and I uh, prefer to be referred as a woman as yeah. she, right? So can I play this for men? But like, let's come back to Emily and tools, right? Yeah. <clears throat> for anybody who haven't read Come As You Are, it's magnificent book. <laughs> magnificent is a word of this podcast, yes. right? Um, I think the biggest uh, part of Emily's explanation of why we are normal and how to feel more normal is a dual control model um, that exists in our mind. And this model uh, regulates multiple processes in our body and uh, arousal, yeah. desire, is one of such processes. And she explains it in very simple words. Um, she says that we have um, accelerator mm -hmm. and we have a brake. Accelerator are all of the things that we see, hear, smell, imagine, taste, that uh, make us turned on. Okay. So it says, go for it, you know, arousal. And break are all of the things, again, that we see, smell, uh, and imagine that uh, take us, no, it's not a good time, turn off. Um, and there are many examples of this, and I think uh, it's a great exercise to go through this book or even on your own to figure out what things are sexually arousal for you that hit your accelerator and what are the things that stop you from going there? If you want, because for me it was very powerful, especially recovering from, from abuse. And I, I know there's a lot of women that have gone through abuse, right? So for I'm going to speak in my case, when I started to, to study Emily's work, 
I realized for me a big break was to feel pressured to have sex. Mm. So for me, there was a context where it was expected that there was going to be sexual yeah. context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just shut off and don't go. So for example, if someone asks me out on a date and they want me to go to their house, the probability mm. is that I would not even continue that, right? And I would feel really attacked. It was your break. It was a huge break one. for me. But then when I met different kind of men where there was no pressure, yeah. there was no expectation about sex, that was like a hitting a like Ferrari accelerator, you know? Because I felt safe and I felt respected and I felt that I could use my voice. Mm. And when I realized that, I started to become very vocal about this, right? If yeah. I, you know what, if I feel any pressure, it's not going to work for me. And in that part, I started to recover my power. And it was through Emily's work. So I feel it's so important to, there's an exercise there where she helps you go through what are your accelerators and what mm -hmm. are your brakes. And once you start to work with them, they, they can... For me now, my break was huge break. Mm -hmm. And now it's a smaller break mm -hmm. because I know I have the force to communicate, right? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. like this doesn't work for me. It's not okay. Yeah. And then now it's not as hard as before. Yeah, it's extremely important to figure out what it is for you because it can be very different for each of us. Uh, I have plenty on both sides, as okay. <laughs> I'm sure you do. One of the biggest breaks that comes to my mind right now is also a pressure, but pressure of time. Yeah. I know if I'm in a rush, if I have important meeting or something okay. like that, I wouldn't even start anything, uh, any sexual experience, because I will not be able to relax. And for me, it's important to transcend into that experience, uh, okay. right? So if there is any sort of time pressure, no, no. no. Okay. I would rather not. I would rather uh, redesign it or do it uh, some okay. other time, you know? I think what she also talks is a context, yes. right? Because we have brakes and accelerator, but sometimes context they are expressed in would influence our desire. And example, let's say you are a romantic type and you like, uh, we can get away in a hotel with your partner when it's like very magical and you go for it. And this is something that always turns you on anticipation of it. You're excited to plan what dress you're gonna use and, and so on. However, normally it works this way, but right now, let's imagine you have stressful job, something happened, mm -hmm. you haven't slept for six days, mm -hmm. you're really thinking about that problem. And despite the fact that you are brought to that hotel, the context has changed for you. You are not able to enjoy it, you're not able to yeah. relax because there is something else going on. So things that were pleasurable may become less pleasurable. So it's very important to understand that sometimes you're totally fine and yeah. your brakes and accelerators work as they're supposed to be, but the context you're in is very different. This, this is very common, for example, after maternity, right? Like oh, a lot yeah. of things change yeah, in maternity yeah, yeah. and it's not that women are wrong. It's just yeah. the context has changed and that change of context needs to take time to, to exactly. readjust itself, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, one of the... Um, exercises we can recommend is this one, brakes, accelerators, yeah. and so on. And what Emily says, and I think it's so powerful, that in popular media, we are often encouraged to accelerate, okay. right? So we would have some magazine articles that tell us, oh, buy sexy lingerie or, you know, buy sex toys or anything like that. But the more powerful part is to remove the brakes. Ah, because... Really like in the car, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will go on. Yeah, yeah. If you remove the brakes, so it will move on. Uh, so this is something that I found for me worked the best, really. Like working on your... Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's what I shared, right? Like I was able to remove my brakes and then woohoo, it goes. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. Let's talk about some other tools because I think uh, there are plenty. Yeah. And let's talk about uh, popular media, right? Remove ourselves from science a little bit. Okay. So Netflix. Okay, yeah, we can go to Netflix. <laughs> Netflix. Uh, you know Goop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Goop. We've talked, yeah. Goop Labs, yes, right? Yeah. So uh, Goop Labs was something that Gwyneth Paltrow ran. Um, and uh, there she would invite different specialists on sexuality as well. Yeah. And there was uh, one uh, lady that works more on the spiritual space. Uh, her name is Jaya. Yeah? Jaya developed a sexual blueprint. And that blueprint was looking into the way you get aroused. Okay. So she helped people to identify their type uh, and figure out what tools work for them. 
because often we have a problem with initiating sex, but then we can go on. It's uh, responsive desire yeah. versus spontaneous desire, but that initiation is a problem. So uh, you know it because I know we've done this test. Yeah. <laughs> there are, um, I think, five types, right? So energetic, sensual, sexual, kinky, and shapeshifter. Exactly. Yeah. Well, who are you? I'm kinky. <laughs> <laughs> it's a confession. <laughs> It's a public a big confession that I'm happy. Yeah, Natalia, you're putting me on the spot. I feel most people I'm on think. the spot too. <laughs> we are vulnerable. You know, maybe this is I sex. <laughs> most people would think I am energetic. I know I am kinky. Yeah, what yeah, about yeah. you? Um, I have uh, <laughs> three leading ones. Okay. Yeah, energetic, shapeshifter, and central. Okay. But I think it changed through life because, again, yeah, yeah, we are yeah. changing. And I was going through phases, uh, discovering some of these other, other sides I of me. I know I'm uh, We're not going to tell these stories. But yeah, uh, I think what it helps us to understand is that we are actually all different. And if your partner is sexual, sexual is focused on what we normally think sex is. Intercourse, bodies, nakedness. And you are energetic. Exactly. So you are focused on environment your mood, how you feel, it doesn't mean that you're not compatible. You can find a way to communicate to each other and work a little bit in their segment while they work exactly. in yours and provoke that desire. Yes. So this is also one of the tools. Then uh, Can I just yeah, tell deepen me. on that? Because I think it's so beautiful because it's touching back again on, on the alien thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like, <laughs> like what I've figured is like... <clears throat> You're not wrong or right because of your the way your your blueprint is, and I'm not right or wrong. It's not better and it's not worse. It's just different. And I think one of the biggest things I hear because I like to talk to women about sex, right? <laughs> and I think one of the biggest things I hear is like I'm when we think about vulnerabilities, I'm afraid to to start sex with my partner. Like right? mm. that's one of the biggest fears. Like when it's a longer term term relationship, is like we haven't had sex in some time, and yeah, I'm, yeah, and yeah. I'm really scared of like starting sex. And I feel it's very common when people have different blueprints that the way you want to initiate sex is not the way your partner likes to be initiated in sex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and maybe yeah. there's ideas you have that your partner is not really excited about. Yeah. And I feel like in our culture, because of all the sex scripts, we feel like they don't love me. They mm. don't care about me. This our is self-worth yeah, exactly, comes our from self there. There's a rejection. Mm. When in reality, if we see ourselves as aliens and then you question them, like, what's going on? Like, what do you want? You know, and, and I think once you understand the blueprints, it's very easy to see what blueprint people are. It's, it doesn't take big effort. And I feel then you understand, right? Like, this person has a different blueprint than me. Mm -hmm. And how can we find a way where we, we both can yeah. meet each other's <laughs> necessities? Or maybe this is my blueprint, but it's fun for me to explore right now this other person's blueprint. Yeah. And I think that part of... Playing. Like, playing, exactly. <laughs> you know, playing. And just like, don't think it that seriously because it could be happening. It's not a rejection towards your person. Maybe the person has very strong breaks. Maybe the context is not right for the person. Maybe this person has a different blueprint. And it hasn't... I feel like there's very few times when it has to do with you and in reality it has to do with that the person is an alien and <laughs> yeah. that you are not understanding the difference between this person and yourself and the empathy that it takes to understand okay like what is this for you, mm. you know? and it doesn't have to do anything with me is what it is for you and how can we communicate to create a bridge between us it's like different languages exactly right? we speak different languages exactly. and when you learn a new language it takes time and exactly. sometimes you rely on other means of communication exactly. like gestures vi visual part right yeah. but like if we are speaking actually the same language this is such a powerful tool yeah. that we can we can communicate our desires and so on uh, it's sometimes take time to learn, but uh, it's it's the way to get there. But it's a good investment. <laughs> it is a good investment. Invest to Spartan <laughs> Comodo. There's a lot of courses on that, right? <laughs> you know, uh, it brought me to another, another tool, but in a way... Um, we all talk about the same things, but uh, shaped in a different way, right? Yeah. Or like different frameworks. There is one... Um, framework that is connected specifically with the initiation okay not even with uh, arousal that much but like how would you like to start yeah and this is from dr petra zibrov she calls it four types of sexual initiation okay. and i now don't remember all of the types but i remember this one that is called 
sensitive emotional because I found it very um, interesting maybe a bit different from from me it was somebody who likes to have very kind conversation with words of affirmation mm -hmm. and when they hear that they are loved and this is actually the most sexy thing for I them I think I am that way. this is something that yeah. initiates sex for them so yeah. not that crazy part yeah, yeah, yeah. you know but actually very kind yeah. and thoughtful and trustful way that will make them feel aroused yeah and, and then really i can cool. go to yeah <laughs> okay now we know now we know <laughs> Yeah. Okay, what is the other ones? Or could could we talk a bit more about about this? Or no, maybe maybe we, 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 we leave you to, to, to study it. Okay, so how can we put all of this into practice? <laughs> practice, practice, practice. It's the best part of it, yes, right? Yes, because if we're thinking about uh, sex as a game, yeah. then you need some practices, no? <laughs> what can we do? Bring yes. your book to bed. No, just kidding. Mm -hmm. No, I'm also guilty of uh, staying in the theoretical field yeah. for a long time. And I think what really helps me is transferable skills. <laughs> ah, okay, I love this. Yeah, okay. So looking at my other parts of life, yeah. and you mentioned that uh, uh, I have a company, also yeah. a training company that does uh, trainings on uh, life design. Uh, this is something that we work with universities and other companies with, where we help the audience to design their life and different aspects of their lives, normally their career, okay. using uh, design thinking principles. Okay. Yeah. So I'm actually thinking that design thinking is applicable to many, many spheres of okay. our lives, including sexuality, including sex itself, including relationship and so on. So what about I walk you through this process? Yes, yes. <laughs> so you would say like a way to practice sexuality is to use design thinking in sexuality. This is yes. what you are saying. Okay. Well, it's for me. Okay, okay. There I'm are many, many I'm, ways I'm to practice. I'm interested. I want to, I want to know. I think what I like about this design thinking that it's uh, a process biased towards action. Okay. And uh, it removes all of the thinking part, really, okay. despite the name. <laughs> and it makes you to make that first step. Okay. And first step is the hardest normally, and then you just go because it's inertia and so on. So design thinking is the process of uh, first concentrating on the user, because normally it's used for product design, okay. right? And so we're user, tech, ex tech so this is where it's coming from. <laughs> concentrating on the user, user in this case, in the case of our sexuality, is us. Okay. Right? The we, are, okay. we are the user of our life. We are the user of our sexuality. We want to learn about this user as much as possible. Okay. And this is what we just went through. We went through different tools. Uh, we went through different exercises. Okay. So the first phase, which is empathy to the user, we collect the data. Wow. We collect the data about ourselves. That's why self-discovery is so, so essential. Then next stage, it's we like, move... Sorry, I'm going to interrupt a bit. It's like <laughs> Nemi yes. Nagoski, like your brakes, your accelerators, your contacts. What is your sexual blueprint? What yes. is your experiences? What are the ideas you have? What are the scripts? Yeah, yeah, like they know you, the more you know about your perspective, the better of your designing a good exactly. sexual experience exactly. for yourself. Because first stage is wow. the more data... About the yourself. better about yourself. Okay. Your partner can be as well, depends what you're designing. Okay. Let's focus about yeah, our yeah, sexual yeah. experience first. Next stage in design thinking is defining the problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is so essential. And that's why the first step is very important too, because we have assumptions of the problems that we have. And often they also come from scripts. Wow. For example, at the beginning of uh, this talk, we mentioned about why don't we have so much sex? Yeah. yeah? yeah. So let's say our initial assumption is um, I don't have enough sex. And then when we observe ourselves and we go into that uh, data collection, we may define the problem very differently. Maybe it's not the problem that we don't have enough sex or too much sex. Maybe the problem is our desire. So observing ourselves, we understand that if we would have a desire, we would have more sex, okay. right? So we define the problem better. Next stage... I'm, I'm going to interrupt. Is it okay? When we think about design thinking, like thinking about my time in Google, we, the most important thing you can do is define the correct problem. Like this was something we would always try. Like if For you that know, time, Exactly, yeah? yeah. If you're able to formulate the problem correctly... 90% of the job is, is done. Many times we are trying to 
trying to fix in a solution to a problem. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. first step is to think about the problem. And I love yes, it, right? Like yes. sometimes it's like, I, I'm not having sex and this is the problem. And maybe the problem is I don't, my sex drive mm -hmm. or I don't feel trust. You know, like really being able to name the problem. Mm -hmm, that will mm -hmm. be the point, right? The, the capacity to go inside you mm. and to really connect to what's going on. Not what society is telling you, not the solution, but yeah. okay, for me, what's going on? And maybe sometimes you can figure out that there was no problem. Wow. <laughs> you know, because for you, it's sufficient amount of sex and or it's good sufficient yeah. amount of partners. And what, what it was, was some pressure that someone else created for you. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll explain this, this process because I feel like it might be useful for many other spheres okay, of yeah. lives, but we'll stay focused on sexuality. So assuming it's a desire problem and it's a problem yeah, for you, yeah, not for everybody. Um, next stage in design thinking is a process that is called ideation. Okay. And this is about taking the data we collected thinking about that problem and generating as many ideas as possible about how could we, how might we wow. fix the problem. So not how will we fix the problem yet, how, we how we. might we. Yeah? So we want to uh, have quantity, we want to go expansive. Okay. And here we can write all the crazy ideas we want to try for ourselves or with our partner, if we had no boundaries uh, for exploration. And it would be great to write it down, write it down, write it down. And then our mind is always looking for the way to filter and actually commit to something. So then we go to the next stage, which is rapid prototyping. Okay. <laughs> rapid prototyping is looking at all of our ideas and selecting one, two that we will so, execute. Yeah, execute. Okay. This brings us towards action. The way to select, there are many ways how you can come there, but sometimes it's uh, less uh, effort, more impact, or vice versa. Something that you can implement pretty quickly. Okay. In the next three days, in a week. Uh, the shorter is a period of time, the more chances that you will try it. Okay. So out of all of the ideas that we had, maybe we'll figure out that our break is uh, surroundings. And we know that we need to have candles, we need to have beautiful music and dim light. So this will be a prototype. Let's take this one prototype and next time we schedule sex because it requires time, uh, we will set up the scene so we feel comfortable and this will be our prototype. And then we go test. And in design thinking, you always come in a loop. So when you test, you have more data to feed your next design process. And every time you can go further and further up, in your process of self-discovery and designing your magnificent wow. sex. I love what you're sharing because I feel there's a big component in this and we can share a story we have together. I will share the story. I never Which thought one? I was going to share... Is it safe? <laughs> I never thought I was going to share this story in public, public, but I will share it. Samantha's story. So I think it's <laughs> very powerful one. and it has to do with, with fast prototyping, right? Beautiful one. And I feel one of the most beautiful things about what you're sharing is in fast prototyping, you're not looking for the correct solution. Mm. You're looking for learning and it's a game. Faster way to experience. Faster way to experience. You are not looking for the correct solution. You're not looking for winning. You're looking for experimenting, yeah. right? And learning by doing. And learning by doing. It's the not, principles. Wow. Yeah. It's not that I'm going to get the correct answer right now. I'm going to fix this. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. It's more like how can I experience a bit more around this reality? Yeah. And get more data. And get more data. Tell us about Samantha. I know, I now <laughs> regret it. I miss Fer in the set. Fer, come back. <laughs> I, no, no, no. Okay, I will share the story. I, I was living in Dublin and I had a heartbreak. So it's horrible that many of my very good stories start with heartbreak, but <laughs> this is how it is. So I had a heartbreak and I was doing my coaching certification. And uh, I realized in coaching, we did an exercise about if we are a piano, we can all play all the notes in the piano, but with life, we lose some of the notes. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had loosened the note about feeling sexy and beautiful. And we decided to do a life. It was very similar to what you're doing of how can I recover my sense of like being sexy and beautiful. And uh, this was an amazing coach that was working with me and we created a character, right? And the character's <laughs> name was Samantha. <laughs> 
And Samantha was totally different from Isabel. Like she was like dressing with tiger footprint and she was like going on dates. <laughs> I remember the time. It was so much fun. And then we started to laugh a lot. Like I forgot about my heartbreak as it happens usually. And I was just like laughing and laughing and laughing. And she told me like, you need to go to a store and buy Samantha's outfit. This is the first step. But you need to like really do it, right? So I went in Dublin, it was, uh, and I went dressed like Samantha, first of all, and that was like super fun because I was in Dublin city center and I found a friend that he was like, what are you doing? And then I was like going through stores, like acting like Samantha. And then I moved to Portugal. And in Portugal, I didn't know anyone in Portugal. <laughs> and I didn't have any clothes for Portugal. So I said, you're taking this to the next level. So I bought all my clothes from Portugal online on Nasty Gal, which is a very <laughs> sexy store. And I bought like, uh, tigers, shirts, and crop tops, and like things I would never ever use. You created a character. I created a character, but I was very serious about her, and I said, <laughs> nobody will know you in Portugal. And you know, Isabel is staying in Dublin, Samantha is landing to, to Portugal. And I think a big uh, important part of this, and I'm realizing now it was desi life design, is that for me, it was not that Isabel was wrong. Mm -hmm. I was not attacking Isabel. I was not saying goodbye to Isabel. Isabel was nice and fun and everything. This was a game I was playing. You with were myself. prototyping I Samantha. Was, I was prototyping Samantha <laughs> and I was having fun. And I think that was what made the huge difference because before I had been like, you need to be like this. Mm. You need to be like this to be loved. And with Samantha, I was just having a blast. Yeah. Like she, she was so much fun. And so I arrived to Portugal and I only have these clothes, you know, and I have <laughs> no other way to do it. And I remember I would go out for runs and be like, what which, and Portugal has very handsome men, no? So I would go <laughs> for runs and I would be like, okay, Isabel would never smile at this man, but Samantha would. would yeah. So I would be like, you know, and I'd go like this, and I would do all these things like I would never have done. And it was so impressive because you met me back yes. again in Portugal. And my body changed physically, my skin changed, my hair changed, I started to look very beautiful, and something really crazy happens that men from my past all arrived, I lived in a small town, and <laughs> men from my past were all in the small town. I was like, what the f what's going on, you know, with these men? And I was like, no, no, Samantha is better off without these men, and I just left. But how did it make you feel in other areas of your life? And I think exactly. It applied to, for example, in work, I became much more expressive. It's yeah. when I started to deliver more trainings. I became more creative. And I started to see life as a game. Mm. And I think for me it was beautiful because it was seeing life as a game. Mm. It was not about attacking myself or anything. It was just really fun. And then I remember I would go to thrift shops and play a character of Samantha going for shopping. And I... It was beautiful, like it was a beautiful way to reconnect with myself. In the end, I don't think Samantha was, is, is like the character I want to be. And I think there was like a mixture. Now I'm a bit of Samantha and a bit of Isabel and yeah. they're mixed together. You're reconnecting, reintegrating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it was such a powerful experience. And now I'm realizing it was design thinking. And <laughs> it was transformative in a deep, deep level for me. I feel it was the first time in my life where I felt beautiful, for example. Wow. Like where yeah. I really felt beautiful. Yeah. I, it was the first time in my life where I felt attractive. Like in a deep way, you know? Um, and it, it, it opened a way for, in my life, like a huge way. I think it was... You first, created I it. I created, right? yeah. And now I feel this is therapy for me, so we'll stop. But I'm realizing that from that point on is when I started to see, okay, should I quit Google or not? Because I feel from this place of empowerment, it the question of like, I can create something different. If I can create You are looking for what's yours. Exactly. Yeah. And you know what you're describing um, actually? I can uh, realize this. <laughs> Some realization. What you are describing is called creative confidence. Mm. Uh, it's again something that is described as part of uh, design thinking process by fathers of design thinking. Uh, Tom and David Kelly, they opened IDEO Design Thinking Consultancy. In their book, they describe uh, this, this situation uh, with uh, psychological trauma. So they talk about a person that is afraid of snakes. Okay. Yeah. So they say, okay, uh, this person works with a psychologist and psychologist tells them, okay, you're gonna go today and touch a snake. And they're like, no way, I'm not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they say, okay, but what if we just take, the snake is in another room mm -hmm. and we're here. So we just take a couple of steps towards the door. Are you okay to do that? 
Yes, okay, so there you go. Then, okay, and now we're gonna touch uh, the door, we're gonna open it and just look. Is it okay for you? Yes, yes. okay. Well, and they end up actually touching the snake, taking little steps. Yeah. But what they t noticed in this psychological experiment is that when people that had the snake phobia touched the snake, it transformed other parts of their lives. Because then they went and they did uh, took risks at work yeah, yeah, yeah. or you know went on a date yeah. or did something that they would didn't expect from yeah. them because in this process they acquired creative Spe confidence yeah. and this is true when you do something in one part of your life you it can transfer it, it into other yeah. yes yeah <laughs> and i think there's a story you shared i don't know if you're comfortable sharing about how uh, how creative confidence has impacted your life like how did you discover this compact concept or how it has impacted your life which one are you referring to? No, you tell, you tell the story you want to tell. I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, I think uh, I try to... trans. I think I know what story you're talking about. I wouldn't share it right now. Okay. But I really try to transfer skills from one field to another. And initially, I didn't feel like it was possible. But I also felt like some of the confidence that I gained in my sexuality influenced my everyday work okay. and made me more um, confident with presenting to large audiences or mm -hmm. having difficult conversations with uh, people that report to me because I could really listen and I was creating that psychological safety for myself and okay. others to share. And uh, design thinking is something that I also use in my relationship building. Okay, For example, yeah. also transferring these skills to, to something else because um, living in non-monogamous relationship, it's a constant process of communicating, sharing, discovering your fears, discovering your boundaries, and then setting new rules. Yeah. And uh, design thinking really helps because you can always prototype something new and experiment and see if it works or then revisit and change it. Okay. And I think any relationship, monogamous, non-monogamous, is a work, we know that. Yeah. And if we were a little bit more creative, we would not feel stuck. Okay. We will have always a chance to redesign it in our way and create our own I rules. love this. <laughs> okay. I know, uh, because I feel this is something really the audience would love to hear. Because, or, okay, I'm going to talk, I would love to hear. <laughs> How would this process look in, like, we've talked about life design in sexuality. Mm -hmm. Can we do, like, just a brief overview of how life design would look in a relationship? Like, how <laughs> could you design? So I remember one day we were together and you told me, Isa, relationships, you, you can't design your relationships. And for me, it was like a mind-blowing concept because I feel I've always resisted relationships because the pattern I was born with didn't fit with me. Mm -hmm. And then when you mentioned that concept of you can actually design your relationship, for me, it was mind-blowing. I think to answer this question, we will need to record a couple of more trainings. Okay. <laughs> it's a long process. I can uh, tell you a little bit how I approach it for myself. Okay. Okay. I think that whenever we start relationship, let's say romantic relationship, but even friendship, we fall to the scripts. Okay. We think that relationships should develop in a certain way, yeah. and often it's called relationship escalator. You heard about it? No. Relationship escalator is the steps you take okay. to ah, get to okay. certain yeah. level. So let's say you go on a date, what follows next? Third date, you go to someone's house, yeah. next you start to travel together, then you live together, you get married, and you have kids and you die. <laughs> <laughs> right? But uh, <laughs> let's say... For somebody who's in a multiple relationship, this may not apply because then you have different partners and there are many things to manage. So instead of falling in the existing scripts, what if, what if okay. we could start with uh, identifying what is relationship for us? Wow, like this was for me. <laughs> if we could ask maybe even early on um, to our partner, um, you know, what do you think about when you say romantic relationship? Okay. What does it mean for you to be loved? How shall this be expressed? What does it mean to be betrayed? We often hear, oh, he's a cheater or she's a cheater. And people feel like, oh, cheater means certain thing. 
But for me, in my relationship, uh, cheating can be very different than for you yeah. in your relationship. You know, I hear stories from uh, uh, some of the friends that, uh, you know, cheating is like in someone's picture on Instagram, while for other people, sex would not be cheating because yeah. the agreements that exist in their relationship it's are different. very different. Yeah. So imagine if we also look through design thinking lens and we collected that data that we never, never ask about. And then first, in this phase, we could learn so much more about that other person or people. We could uh, learn what sort of people they are. Do we even want to be in this relationship wow. with them? I think it's a big part of prototyping that you not only check your idea, and if it has a place for existence, you check if you are connected to your idea or you only thought you're connected That's to your so idea. That's so powerful. Yeah. I yeah. think just today we did the exercise of asking people what are the questions that you should be asking in a relationship, you know? And I think for me, I've never asked myself that question. It's like, if I'm thinking about entering a relationship with someone, what are the questions I need to ask? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that are key for me to feel safe? Mm -hmm. And I think creating this... And again, we, we go back to sex, right? It's like if you can create a safe environment yeah. where both parties can express their perspectives and maybe coming to an agreement that there's this, this relationship doesn't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe one of my key perspectives and needs is not something you can, you can provide and, or maybe something that's really important for me, I can provide. And removing the idea that right, wrong, yeah, good, bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. but just like sitting and saying, you know, like this is really important for me and then, okay, can I, can I support you in that way or, or maybe it's not possible for me right now. Or maybe we can create an agreement where that need could be met in a different way, wow. you know. I think Esther Perel, she always gives this example, which I find uh, hilarious and so true, that uh, nowadays we have the same expectations from our partners as years ago, but we have very different conditions and context we live wow, in. Wow. She says, previously we were living in a village all our life. Our life was like 40 years long, yeah. and we only had about five people to choose from. And, you know, someone already was in love with someone else. So in the end, there were just two. And the choice yeah. was very obvious. And then as the life expectancy was so short and there were a lot of econ economical conditions that would bring us closer together. So we needed to form yeah. these unions. We were with that person. Now we are in a globalized world. We travel. We have careers. We have abundance of choice everywhere. We have dating apps for any, any taste yeah. and form right and we live longer on average we do live longer and expect from that one person to be your whole universe it's a lot to ask for and especially for your entire life right mm -hmm. because we all change we go through life and we change and someone we met 20 years ago is not uh, the one that they are right now yeah. so being able to communicate and i'm not talking about uh, only you know different forms of relationship but even like in existing relationship whatever form it is to be able to communicate okay this is me now this is how i changed what about you this is my values this is how i see relationship can we negotiate is there something that we can do and i think i would bring <laughs> from what you're saying that i find beautiful is the snake metaphor right i feel like for me i've never been in a non-monogamous relationship and i feel like from where i'm standing now it looks like a very scary place right mm -hmm. like it looks like there's a lot of like ideas i have and like preconceptions that could need to be transmitted but I also like this idea about touching the snake. Mm. So I feel like how can you create also, and I find this beautiful, I would love to experience it in, in my lifetime, is how do we create a container where I understand your needs, you understand my needs, and we can say, okay, right now in this moment, I cannot be supportive of that need, mm -hmm. but why don't we create the conditions so slowly we move towards that? So, you know, like maybe, okay, you want a non-monogamous relationship, okay, why don't we open up for you to start going on dates for coffee, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's like the first step. Mm. And then maybe we see if we kiss together with another person. I don't know. It's, it's just an example. I see you getting creative. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like also when you think about creating relationships, I find it fascinating because I feel it's, it's beautiful, this, this concept of it removes the idea that people are broken. Mm. I feel there's a big of, I, I see, I'm going to, I hope, I don't get it, but I see a lot of my friends that cheat 
and I feel they don't cheat because they're bad people is their way of relating is different mm. and if they were able to show themselves as they are to their partner and negotiate an agreement that worked for both mm. they wouldn't need to be coming into betrayal and I'm not blaming it on their partners or on yeah, them yeah. I'm just saying that this concept that if you're different you're broken mm. and you should be excluded from society and there's something wrong with you I feel it's really hurtful yeah. and I feel opening a safe space where we can communicate about these things And I can listen to you and we can come into agreements and maybe do a plan into the future. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where, okay, right now I'm not ready, but how can we work toward that plan? Yeah. And I think that is really powerful and really beautiful. And it has to do with relationship design as well. Sometimes what's needed, and I saw it uh, talking to friends of mine that uh, are designing their relationship. Wow. <laughs> I saw that sometimes what's needed is just to have a possibility of okay. it. Execution is sometimes not even coming to a picture. I told you about my friend yeah. uh, who's a bisexual person, now married and has uh, a kid, but for a long time she couldn't decide to do that step, okay. to get married and especially to have uh, a kid. But when uh, her and her now husband uh, decided that they will have an agreement for 10 years, And then in 10 years, they will review it. So for 10 years, they commit to make it the best 10 years for each other. And they will really work hard on it. Yeah. And then whatever happens next, they will review. And if uh, rules needs to be changed, they will change. So she told me that that liberated her. Okay. She wanted to explore her sexuality. But now she doesn't have such a big need to go explore it with someone else. Yeah. Because she has this future freedom. Okay. And it makes her comfortable now. Yeah. Can you imagine? Just the possibility of it. It's so beautiful. Yeah, because I think this forbidden fruit is uh, what is so sweet for us. But it's also like a little bit difficult, right? Because it brings these other things that are not that nice. Like betrayals and so on. And when you remove that forbidden fruit notion and you allow uh, freedom, maybe you don't really want to go and explore that much, which is really interesting side of the coin too. I love it. <laughs> and I feel like that is really about, I feel one of the things I want to have in my friendships is, and in my relationships is to people to feel safe with me to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Also beautiful, yeah. And, and I think this conversation comes from how can we create relationships when we create a safe space for people to be themselves. And there's not judge them, not point them. Of course, I'm not an expert. I have a long way to go. But I, feel like, <laughs> but I feel like that is the starting point. It's like if we can... And I feel now thinking like this should be a process that we do in all our relationships, yeah. right? In friendship relationships, in business relationships, in father-mother relationships, mm -hmm. right? It's how can we design our relationships in a way that works for, for both parties? And how can we have these conversations? Because we talk about what we did in the job, what we ate, something fun that happened, a book we're reading, but we don't really have these conversations about how do we want to interact? Yeah. You know, how do we want to relate to each other? Yeah, yeah. And that is very powerful. So we're coming a bit to, to, to an end here. And I would love to ask for you to talk about sex tech. Because I know <laughs> it's, it's an area that you have also studied. And I think it would be yeah. really fun for everybody to hear a bit more about sex tech. <laughs> sex tech. So much fun. Yes, true. It's, uh, it's so, so much fun for me because okay. I am a futurist, really. Okay. Uh, all <laughs> Aquarius. My life, uh, Aquarius, yeah. <laughs> I was so curious about what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I had to bring myself back to present. But uh, I would read all the sci-fi books, you know, all of the movies. So learning about sex tech, uh, I think maybe five, six years ago, Uh, really, really made me very excited. Okay. I mean, obviously, things that I will now name are sex tech existed longer, yeah. but I think the term came out. Uh, Brian Nicole, uh, I really love her. I studied at her school and met her a couple of times. She's godmother of sex tech. Okay, what's her name again? Brian Nicole. I had Hi, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, She started a couple of years ago a podcast called Future of Sex. Okay. <laughs> she lived in uh, New York City, I think, and she would go and talk to multiple people and just ask them a question. What do you think future of sex is? How would that look okay. like? Yeah, yeah. What do you think people responded? Robots? I don't know. Robots! Yeah, <laughs> robots would be one of them, yeah. So robots, virtual reality sex, uh, teledildonics, which means sex on a distance. Okay. Yeah. 
and uh, then different type of toys, all, all the craziness, but like robots was, was the big one, big one, right? So sex tech now as the industry, I think it's more than $30 billion industry and it's growing. And I'm so happy to see even in um, popular media, like The Economist, they are writing now about sex tech and they say that 2023 will be a year of sex tech, oh! a year of sexuality in general. So let's see, we're getting there, we are. <laughs> we are prepared. <laughs> yeah, sex tech is an um, industry that combines uh, tech ventures that are focused on enhancing our sexuality. Okay. And it can come in any shape and form. Normally, it includes what I mentioned already, like, you know, robots and teledildonic and virtual sex, but not only. It also touches some other areas that existed before, but it looks at it from inclusive point of view. So, for example, part of sex tech would be also dating apps, but that go beyond what we know. Dating apps for people with disabilities or for polyamorous people or anything like that, so more niche. Uh, can be also porn, but inclusive porn. Okay. There are many, many um, resources now, places and platforms when we can watch really, really good porn that can be educational because we see different body shapes, we, we see different gender expressions, we see like everything how it is in life, you I know? Love I, I, I was never a fan of porn. Like growing up, people say like watch porn and I was like, I never could connect to porn. And then I met a uh, make love, not porn. Cindy Gallup, Cindy yes. Gallup. And it's <laughs> so beautiful because it's like... You want to oh, tell what's that? Like Cindy Gallup, she, she, she said like, um, exactly, like porn is, is nice, but it's entertainment and it's not real sex. And so make love, not porn, it's a site where people publish their own videos and they, uh, but it's videos of like real couples. So like mm -hmm. you see people from different ages, you see people with disability, you see people with uh, different shapes of bodies, you see like it's all sorts of things and it's like very real, you yeah. know, like you see like yeah. the mistakes yeah. the, and, and it's... And it's ugly and, and it's ugly. Exactly. It's like everything, but it's beautiful and in all laughter. of this because it's real. Yeah, there's like <laughs> laughter and, and for me it was, before I, I porn I was like, never could watch it and that I'm not like a big big and you will talk about that now right I'm not like a big visual person so I it was mm. not a big thing for me but that was really interesting because it opened my eyes to what okay this is really what this is the same I experience it's not mm -hmm. that different yes and you know there are so many beautiful resources there is a big part of sex tech which is uh, like a trend called oralism so okay. when you listen when you're aroused by listening yeah, yeah? Okay. so audio erotica or even different apps that exist that look into sexual wellness and that use mindfulness for self-exploration or for explanation of some um, new concept, difficult concept like BDSM or something like that. Uh, I know you're a fan of Deep Sea. I am a fan of Deep Sea. Now I'm very ventilated in this podcast. I am a fan of Deep Sea. <laughs> yeah, Deep Sea is one of the audio erotica apps that amazing. we can recommend. It's so good. It's so there are a couple of more fairly choral, uh, those that I can name straight away from, uh, from my head. And uh, they're targeting um, mostly women, I would say, because uh, st stats show that women really connect to their inner world when we fantasize. So visual part is uh, less important for us than, than what happens in our head. So these apps really stimulate our brain and we come up with the pictures and we get aroused this way. Yeah. I think if you're a woman, you should do, give it a try. <laughs> if you don't want to pay... It's... There is also partnered, uh, partnered audios um, when you can listen with your partner. I found wow. them very, very beautiful. Uh, couples massage or like self uh, like wow. pleasuring pleasuring of the another person so there are a lot of stuff now there <laughs> like check it out uh, i think dipsy also if you're not comfortable like paying directly they're on spotify so mm. you can check like some of the episodes but it's really interesting because i feel many women like feel like oh there's something wrong with me and in reality is like this is the first time in history that things are being created with data that mm -hmm. are really helpful for women. Yeah. And for me, Deep Sea was like, wow, what's going on here? Where before I would watch porn and be like, why do people watch this? Like, what the <laughs> fuck? I, you know? and, and Deep Sea was like very transformative experience for me. About data, I think it's fun. Um, so when I think about sex tech, me personally, I feel, I feel like all the beautiful stuff uh, still has to happen in real life. Okay. And sex tech is only a facilitator, something that helps us, but really it, 
for me, it cannot overtake uh, the rest the, of yeah. it, right? But data part is amazing because technology really can enhance what we know about ourselves. There is a company called Lioness. Okay. Uh, two ladies from a tech world, they developed uh, a vibrator. Okay. Uh, that is... Um, measuring <laughs> contraction of female body when she experiences uh, orgasm mm. and then sends this data to understand your pattern to orgasm <laughs> eh? right so we use big data to teach ourselves then to to orgasm really interesting approach so data driven orgasm data driven if orgasm you're in the tech industry you know data driven well so is it data driven orgasm yes okay. yes yes and i know um we don't want to talk about toys that much because i think toys is the topic that covered the most yeah. But I guess in recent uh, sex tech trends, we see that there are many toys that are developed uh, that are very inclusive. And we go away from that uh, phallic shape uh, mm -hmm. that we always uh, associate sex toys with to something really beautiful, to something that uh, can take all shapes and form and not concentrated on one part of our body, but can go all the way. So this is also part of sex tech. <laughs> wow, it's like opening. I think I, I, it's not sex tech, but you mentioned something to me the other day that I just want to put it in, in the space because I think it's so beautiful. And it's not sex tech, so I'm changing a bit the <laughs> yes, subject, sure. but I don't want to forget it because I think it's so beautiful. Is this thing you, you, talk, you told me about, like how pleasure centers move. Mm. So that is a bit that we can reconnect or redevelop uh, pleasure centers, right? Mm -hmm. So I, um, again, personal story. I, I took a, a course, beautiful course on sexuality and, and the facilitator was telling us that pleasure is infinite and that it's a bit of like you enter a place where it's very, very pleasurable and you start to get afraid because mm -hmm. it's an un unknown place, right? Mm -hmm. Like before you had gone to a place of pleasure, but then you're going to cross like another border with a bit more pleasure and that is always really scary. Mm -hmm. But if you allow yourself to let go, you enter like a new possibility that you didn't know before. And I think that is beautiful, right? So like the fear you're feeling in the moment, the vulnerability, mm -hmm. just letting go, it allows you to go into a, 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 like another level. And pleasure is infinite. Yeah. And I think that is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing you told me that I loved is that we can develop or reconnect pleasure centers. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I was not a person that would feel pleasure around my breasts. And now I feel it's one of the my most um, pleasurable areas. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because in these practices of like healing and reconnecting to me, I did a lot of breast massage, which is like really recommended in like tantra practices and all that. And now I my breasts are like uh, one of the my most uh, sensual places. <laughs> Too much information, but okay. Uh, and you mentioned like this is very, it's, it's a very common experience, mm -hmm. right? Once mm -hmm. we start to touch a part of the body, then this part of the body starts to mm -hmm. become a place that can get really aroused. And I have, for example, a friend that can, she says her most original song is her feet. And it's not that she was connected in a weird way, it's just she, she has just really explored touching her feet and connecting to pleasure in her feet. And that has made this, area become an erogenous area for a hair. Yeah. And I think I love this concept of how, and, and it's also like a point of moving from orgasm, a goal orientation yeah. towards more like in the moment pleasure, because we can actually create pleasure in other parts of the body that before didn't feel as pleasurable. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. I feel like um, there is also a lot of um, sort of positive scripts that exist, okay. right? And those positive scripts uh, and awareness that we have about our sexuality, influencers that tell us about sex tech and tools yeah. and toys, sometimes still a lot of them are focused on orgasm, yeah. right? And as we learn from Magnificent Sex, yeah. uh, orgasm is important, but also not the only important thing in this journey. Yeah. And I think when we wire our brain a little bit differently and we move from orgasm to pleasure, wow. we actually probably going to reach orgasm anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, there is no pressure, there is no goal, and we are in this journey. And... Indeed, our bodies are really infinite source of pleasure. And the way our mind works, because it's, it's nervous endings, right? Mm -hmm. So when we stimulate a lot one zone, our body learns that this is how 
we receive pleasure and it's the fastest way to receive pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So sometimes it happens that if you use certain types of, uh, uh, certain types of uh, toys, you get used to uh, receive pleasure this way. It doesn't mean that you will not receive pleasure any other way, but it means that maybe if you want to shift, you may uh, stop using that toy, use another yeah, exactly. one, or maybe um, do it different way. Uh, see how your body reacts with a partner, see how your pa- body re- reacts when you are with yourself. And then that pleasure center will move. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. And your body will see, okay, uh, there I knew pleasure. Now I'm not receiving pleasure from that segment. Where can I seek that pleasure? You know, yeah. and this is why sometimes people have all of these beautiful places that they feel they can they're very pleasurable. There. Yes, and they're not exactly focused on what we focus normally on our genitalia. It goes all the way. <laughs> I think. Okay, I'm sharing so much of this. But the biggest orgasms I've had are breathing orgasms by myself. Tell us more. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> Because for somebody, it can be very new yeah. thing right what do you mean by I Natalia guess. don't we just stop breathing <laughs> <laughs> so I, I Natalia I cannot believe I'm doing this I orgasm in planes <laughs> so I can orgasm during a takeoff can you take me with you <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn that too <laughs> and I think it's been very long like I don't think it's a new thing I think it's been since I was uh, younger like a teenager it started to happen And I think I can orgasm with breath. And the strongest orgasms I've had in my life have been by myself yeah. with no touch. Breathing. I'm, I'm a meditator and I, I do a lot of breathing exercises. And yeah, once I had an experience that it was like very long, like, mm. um, and it was just through breathing. Yeah. And yeah. I feel it really breaks the idea of how our bodies work and penetration and all that because I don't, like, this might feel like, oh, wow, this woman can do this well. <laughs> and I've met a lot of women that have gone through these experiences uh-huh. and they say it's like, Isa, they come and they're like, you need to hear this. <laughs> and I'm like, they're like, wow, it was so amazing. I was such in contact with my body. And I've realized these experiences come a lot from when we allow, allow ourselves to be ourselves. Mm-hmm. And there's like a creative impulse behind. Like when there's a lot of creativity that wants to go in, for me it's a high probability that if I go into a plane, of course I need to be by myself. It's really awkward, right? Because there's like a neighbor next to me. I <laughs> But <laughs> you shifted from the script of how to orgasm, right? Yeah. You shifted to a different environment, a different context. And you know, it first of all makes me want to say, wow, our, <laughs> our female bodies are capable of so much. Yeah. But also I want to add that it's not only female bodies, it's anybody, yeah. any, anybody, because... I heard uh, and seen <laughs> a situation also for men when um, men experience orgasm without touch and without ejaculation because this is what uh, we often are associate uh, male okay. orgasm yeah. with, right? Because it's very um, visible, not as much as in females, uh, just uh, biologically, right? But uh, when you shift from that whole orgasm thing to pleasure, Then you experience yeah, orgasm in many different yeah, ways. I agree, yeah, I agree. <laughs> you explain, experience orgasm in many other ways and in a deeper, more transcendental way as well. It's know? a different way. Yeah, yeah it's a different it's way. It's very interesting. Okay, I don't All want right. to finish this, but we are coming to the end. Yes. Uh, it's a very it's sad thing. It was such a pleasure. It was such a pleasure. It was such a pleasure. Like, this was. Pleasure. How are you doing right now? Is it close? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now serious. No, no, no. It's very serious. Okay. So just as a summary, we talked about the paradox of what's going on in society where we are a very sexual society where we're having less sex. Yes. And then we touch on like sex is not a drive and all this idea that we need to have this sex drive and we talk we really did a big emphasis on sex worth having. Let's have sex worth having. If there's it's not worth having, let's don't have it. Yes. It's better to <laughs> just have sex that's really gonna impact you and empower you and expand you and where you're feeling safe, connected, loved, protected. Maybe if it's just to make you relax and this is what you want, it's something to go for. Okay, and okay. it is also worth having. Yeah. yeah. But 
don't go for sex just to fill an agenda or a point or yeah. even if it's with your partner for years. It's just or fit the script. It's fit the script. So we jumped into scripts and we talk about all the scripts there are around <laughs> sex and how damaging so they are many. and how it's important to transform them and how they have impact all of us. And then we touched on this beautiful thing I love. I'm buying the book as soon as I leave this studio, <laughs> Magnificent Sex. And I think that is so encouraging because we talked about how when people ask what is magnificent sex, nobody focuses on performance or orgasm or ejaculation or penetration. And really magnificent sex is about presence. It's about communication, authenticity, mm -hmm. vulnerability, exploration, intimacy. And I'm going to make a, a commercial here. Many courses of Espacio <laughs> Como no talk about this, 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 yes. this topic. <laughs> so we're really focusing on that. Then we talk about how we can find our way to magnificent sex. So it's about different knowing tools. ourselves. We touch on different tools. Emily Nogowski, Jaya, Petra. And I think the invitation here is to know ourselves, right? Like start to know who you are. And relearn what we know about sex. Approach it with beginner's mind. Approach it as an alien. As an alien. I love that <laughs> about approaching it as an alien. And then we talk about we talked about Emily Nogowski, who I love with all my I adore. We talked about What is this guy's name again? We talked about Jaya. Jaya. We, we talked talk about, about Petra Zebrov. Yeah, you mentioned that. And what is a guy that's like Emily, but for men? Ah, yes. Can it play? <laughs> Can it play? I think it's an irrelevant resource as well. And then we touch on design thinking. So design thinking from in, coming from tech, how we prototype products in tech, how you can use that into your relationships and into your sexuality, and how to use these things we see as problems or lack or a source of shame in a way that we can reframe them in a playful way. And how and can prototype, we do and prototype, yeah, and fast test. prototyping in a playful, <laughs> gameful way. I like it comes with this move. <laughs> yeah, because it reminds me of Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. we finished with uh, sex tech, which is uh, such an amazing field. Uh, it is really for me. But again, one thing I really want to stress is that Sex tech is a facilitator, sometimes it's just helping a little bit, but real magic happens in real life. Uh. Yes. So I think I want to wish uh, to everybody who listens or watches us today to stay curious, to trust yourself and your own journey, whatever it is, and actually be an alien. Ah, yes. Let's be aliens. Let's, let's, be aliens. let's embrace that we are aliens. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And have a beautiful day. Gracias por acompañarnos y navegar con nosotras la incomodidad. Nos puedes encontrar en nuestras redes y visitando nuestra página espacioincomodo.com, donde podrás conocer los talleres y herramientas que tenemos para compartir contigo. Nos vemos pronto.